as an industry, have been talking for many, many years about this relationship between coffee and wine and how, we, how can we make coffee similar to wine and get it closer. And we keep on talking about it. We, a few years ago, decided, well, let's talk seriously about it. So let's see how Colombians' coffee diversity in high-quality coffees from different regions can be sort of looked at in terms of terroirs, in terms of denominations of origin. So we started a few years ago, 2007, I believe it was, talking about terroirs and trying to define terroirs in a scientific way, figuring out how we can understand the relationship between environment and taste. And that's not easy thing to do. And then the challenge is, if you want to get closer to wine, is, well, you can do the science, but then you have to communicate it. Because it doesn't make sense to keep all this information and all this data kept in sunny cafe or kept in, in, in a particular drawer without consumers understanding and clients understanding the differences and how they can use them in, in different ways and different formats. So that's a, that was our challenge. You know, how are we going to use science to communicate in a credible way to consumers? We are, as an industry, or oh, I am at least, as an industry member, tired of these descriptors that you see in some labels, that this coffee comes from these lush mountains and these pristine rivers, and it's different because of that. I know that's, that's, that's not the case. Let's, we have to be credible. So we started doing the science, the interaction between environments and taste. We did lots of work and how, trying to understand the differences between regions and fingerprinting, if you would, the differences between coffees from different regions. We used also or, or put into play the, the varieties. We put into play actually many, many different variables to understand this. In fact, it was 1,234 variables per sample that we analyzed. So you can imagine that spreadsheet is, you know, 1,234 columns and then thousands of rows of different samples from different harvest cycles. And that then trying to understand the relationship between the environmental variables, the biochemical composition variables, and the sensorial variables. And then, once you find some correlations, then you have to figure out, well, are these correlations meaningless or not? Is there causality, as the people in econometrics say? You know, is there causality between this variable and the end result, which is, I guess, acidity or sweetness or whatever you want to, you want to you know, understand uh, the, uh, that particular attribute. So that was the, the, the work that was behind our terroir or denomination of origin strategy. Today we have uh, consolidated Nariño, Cauca, Santander, and uh, Huila, and then we are working on Tolima, we are working on the coffee cultural landscape, which is the UNESCO recognized territory and then the Sierra Nevada. These, these are the, the, the regions we have been working so far in. And we did it. We have this better understanding of what the differences between high quality Colombian coffees are. And then we try to, well, let's put it together in a language that people can understand because we are not going to send that, send that spreadsheet to anyone. And uh, we have to figure out a way to communicate it to industry members and to consumers so that they understand it. So, so, so we started to produce, based on that scientific information, credible information, you know, consumer pieces or marketing pieces like the one you see in the screen right now. But that's part of the terroir aspect of it. You know, how, how, how do we make the differences and, and, and explain the differences? But we have to deal with a lot more information, a lot more... Um, challenge so that that information really permeates because one of the dreams I have is that people will understand the differences of Colombian coffees and be required in different consuming occasions a particular Colombian coffee. So we started with the, our Colombian coffee hub which is the network we have for baristas worldwide communicating those differences. 
and telling people, well, you can start innovating and understanding the differences of Colombian coffees. And then, as a communications tool, we also thought, well, perhaps in the gastronomy industry, we can play a little bit and understand how that particular differences between coffees can be applied in different settings. You all know that when you are going to pay the bill, you are drinking the coffee in a high-end restaurant, so the, the coffee experience must be good so that you produce a good tip. So in that sense, we call upon Bernard with this dream that I have, which is consumers should demand a particular Colombian coffee with that particular dessert. If you are going to give me this carrot cake, that has to go with the Sierra Nevada Colombian. I won't take any other uh, Colombian coffee with other. Uh, and, and that's, you know, I want that demand to be there, that, that understanding to be there, because at, at the end of the day, it's the same wine story. You know, you drink certain wines with certain food. So I'm going to bring Bernard. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Let's uh, start with an experiment. You all uh, received a tube. So you open the tube without smelling, like this, so far away from your nose. Yeah? OK. And then you pinch your nose. Yeah? Everybody pinch his nose. And you pour the sugar into your mouth. So it's sugar. So go ahead, pour the sugar into your mouth. So it's sugar, you will have like a sweet taste and a granular texture from the sugar. And when you open your nose, you will have cinnamon. It's a very easy experiment, but it shows something fundamentally. Namely, that if you look to the flavor, that 80% of the flavor is determined by your nose. You know that when you have a cold, people say, I don't taste anything. Well, actually, you don't smell anything. And if you look to, to flavor as a combination of texture, taste uh, and smell, taste is only five. Let's say five, there are more, but let's say five basic tastes, so sour, sweet, bitter, umami and salty. And they all interact with each other. So if you want to reduce the bitterness, you will add salty, for example. So you have five tastes, but when you go to smell, you can detect more than 10,000 different aroma molecules. If you really look into which aroma molecules are really important, then you can reduce that to a few hundred. So you don't need to analyze to detect all 10,000 molecules. With three, four hundred, you go uh, uh, already far. Um, and the way we um, look at, at, uh, at the aroma, it's like facial recognition. It's a combination of certain molecules in a certain quantity that gives you a pattern, and that pattern you recognize as this, uh, this type as coffee. So aroma, crucial. When you sell coffee, it's mainly the aroma you sell, because in the taste, of course, there's difference, but not that much. It's, it's the aroma which is, uh, is key. We started about 10 years ago to work with uh, chefs all around the world. We're a group of, of food scientists passionate about gastronomy, and we wanted to help chefs uh, to create certain experiences or certain food products, like some of the chefs wanted to have savory meringues. So how can you make that? But one of the questions we often got from chefs was, how can we create more efficient new combinations? My clients demand each time they come to the restaurant that they will, that they will be able to taste something different. If you look now to the numbers of millennials in the uh, in US, 40% of the millennials will take something different each time they go to a restaurant. So people are looking for continuous variation. They want to to have customization. So how, how can we help in that? And there, there was uh, a work, some work done on, on taste, on taste interaction. If you look to, to wine and to beer, it's often taste that interacts with the food. But smell being that important, we very fast found that if you want to create synergy between food ingredients, then it's the aroma which is, is the key. So we started to analyze aromas of ingredients. And the first food pairing we made about 10 years ago was a combination of kiwi and oyster. And why did we make the combination of kiwi and oyster? Well, there was one a chef, a two Michelin star chef, who came to us and said, Bernard, when I smell a kiwi, I also smell the sea. 
Is that possible? So as scientists, what you do, you start to analyze the aromas of kiwi, and you also start to analyze aromas of seafruits. And indeed, one of the molecules, an aldehyde with green, creamy, marine uh, uh, flavor, aroma, was also present into oyster. But fruity components, esters in the oyster, were also present into the kiwi. So there was overlap in the uh, aroma profile. So over, over the last 10 years, we have done a lot of analysis and a lot of research. And the, the important point is that you just can't look at the complete aroma profile of ingredients. You really have to figure out which are the key aroma components of the product. If you analyze coffee, you will detect more than 1,000 different aroma components. Are all those 1,000 important? Not. For example, when you analyze the, uh, the Colombian coffee, 80 to 90 aroma molecules are really key. And it's a combination and a quantity which gives you uh, the total aroma profile uh, of, the, of the product. So it's the interaction between the key aroma components and how, how they help each other or uh, work against each other, uh, which is, uh, is important. To make this a little bit more understandable, you already smelled the, the molecule benzaldehyde. Yeah? Smells like? Almonds, yeah. Benzaldehyde, it's a molecule important for almonds, for marshapon, but also for apple, for cherry. So the molecule is made by biogenesis in a group of, of fruits, and you will have it in the woods, into the flowers, and into the fruits. Like sakura in Japan, also the flowers of the cherry blossom contain the benzaldehyde. If you make a barbecue and you use wood of cherry of apple, you will add benzaldehyde. So it's there from biogenesis, but you can also make it through uh, the Maillard reaction, which you have when you roast or bake uh, a meat. Uh, benzaldehyde, it's a degradation product of, a, of amino acids. So you can also make it through through process. So here is already a combination. So you could make like a, a combination of a black pie with cherries and almonds, or you could do like pears with almonds. So here you see already a few combinations around uh, this molecule. Of course, there are more interactions, but just to, to give you a, uh, an example. So what are, what are we doing as a company? We analyze ingredients from all over the world, from big companies, but also from small producers. We work on insects, we work on seaweeds, we work on bycatch, on waste, coffee, on chocolate, as we're as a R&D center of the company is based in, uh, in Belgium. We do a lot of research on chocolates and on beer. So we analyze, until now, we, we characterize completely about 1,600 ingredients from all around the world. We have a, a project with uh, Peruvian chefs. We, uh, we analyze in Colombian ingredients. We're working with, with Korean people. So all around the world, we're analyzing culinary ingredients. So through different uh, analytical processes, they are put into, into our database, and on top we have created uh, several algorithms. One of the algorithms is to inspire chefs to make combinations. So we will look at interaction between the aroma, and we will map out the possible interactions you can make. And that's used by, by chefs and bartenders in about 150 countries around the world, really to have the inspiration for the continuous variation to customize the food to the needs of their uh, clients. So we've been lucky to work with the best chefs in the world, from El Bui to Noma to, uh, to Dan Barber, New York, to uh, Grant Ackerts, to uh, David Kinch. But also, we do quite some work for, uh, for companies from chocolate to, to beer and, uh, uh, and many more. So when we started to do the project for the Colombian coffee, we were actually quite amazed, because before we thought, we had never analyzed coffee before. Arabica coffee, well, it will be like one profile and they will be more or less the same, but that was not uh, at all uh, the case. For example, if you look to, uh, to Nariño coffee, okay, you grow it at a high altitude, 2,300 meters, so that had an influence on the sugar content, the sweetness, the acidity, but also on the aroma. So when we analyzed the aroma of the Nariño, I will show you an aroma wheel. Different from the previous speaker, our aroma wheels are valued for all ingredients, so we don't have a specific one for coffee. No, it's for all ingredients uh, around the world. So one of the descriptors we detect 
They are fruity molecules. They are mainly esters. In this case, like tropical ester, branch esters, we give a fruity note to the coffee. Of course, you have a lot of roasted notes, but that can come from aldehydes, uh, where you have more malted uh, notes, to popcorn notes, to pyrazines, where you go from earthy to nutty notes, green, a little bit of green notes. Green is like grass, uh, cucumber. Uh, herbal, in this case, is more potato-like molecules. Floral, floral can be like roses or honey. And in this case, is mainly like rose, but rose like in in quince or apple. So, but also rose more connected to to citrus. Woody notes you have, buttery uh, notes, citrus, and in this case, you have a lot of uh, citrus notes mainly determined by a molecule like linalool, which is typical for the coriander seed, the oil of the coriander seed. It has spicy notes, phenolic components, smoky also phenolic components, and this gives you like a full uh, aroma profile. But what we put in our database are the molecules. So it's molecules, and then we put uh, the descriptors uh, on top of it to make it more visible. And there you see, for example, in the, the prominent notes of Nariño, you see Citric coming back, so citrus, and you also see that into the aroma wheel. So how do you go from there to recipes? Well, we visualize it into a food pairing tree. Here you have the central ingredient into the middle, and all around ingredients that you can combine with the coffee. And the closer to the middle, the better the match. So in, in the category of the fruits, you have a lemon and raspberry. Raspberry make a connection to the floral notes, while lemon make a connection to the, to the citrus notes. You also see cream and egg yolk. They also have an aromatic match, but in this case, it will be more as a texturizer, like sugar, cream, uh, egg yolk. They're adding texture, not really for the aroma. So when you're constructing a recipe, you have to take dimensions into account. So aroma is one dimension, but taste, you have to balance the taste. If it's too acid, it will not work. If it's too sweet, it will not work. So in foodpanning.com, this work is done by chefs. We also have tools that can really calculate the balance between uh, uh, the taste. And the texture, to make it interesting, you want to have contrast in texture, contrast in taste, but it's complementary uh, in aroma, what you're looking for. So if you translate that to a dish that can be served with a, a narino. So you have the crispy pastry and you have the creamy pudding of citrus and the raspberry. So you can also start to compare uh, aroma profiles. So one way we have uh, Sierra Nevada coffee versus the, the cultural landscape. The prominent notes with the Sierra Nevada is more like dark chocolate versus the, the cultural, it's like fruitiness. And if you look to the flavor profiles, you also see that. So. If you go to the Sierra Nevada, you see a lot of roasted notes, so a lot of caramelic notes, uh, nutty notes, versus if you look to, to the cultural landscape, you have more fruity and, and green notes. You see that um, Café de Colombia is translating that into like melon, watermelon, while if you actually combine green notes, which is mainly cucumber, with fruity notes, the esters, if you combine them, you will come close to mango or to, to melon, for example. If you look to the, the roasted components, well, if you have much more nutty and caramelic notes, so you will come close to, uh, to the, the chocolate notes. And we have algorithms, actually, to go from this into more uh, sensory descriptors. And this will give you, like, these combinations with the cultural landscape you have, linking to the melon, so the green and the fruity, but also you can link to the, the roasted with the, with the bacon. And on the other hand, you have, you could, Combine it with, for example, roasted nut and chocolate. That's one of the examples you will be able to taste tomorrow. But you could also go into a different direction. And then one of the interesting uh, aromas in, um, in Sierra Nevada is wine lactone. It smells like a coconut, but it's, it's quite in, uh, makes a good connection to coconut. So we made in here a coconut ice cream. And then we used spicy green fruity notes to make a connection to orange and to carrot into the cake. So, of course, to find the combination, um, we have a tool to make it more easier to, to make uh, the connection between the different ingredients. And you go to the foodpairing.com website, you can select the Café de Nariño, you can find the, the aroma profile, and then you can add variation to the combination. So you can say, okay, I want to add a fruit, and he will list up the fruit that match best to the Café de Nariño. So the bigger the green dot, the better the match. But you can also filter for cuisine, 
Maybe you want Brazilian dish, and maybe you want seasonality, so this month, and maybe you want to continue working on the citrus node, or maybe you want to go into the different direction and add more spicy nodes. So this tool will help you to find the best connection each time to the coffee. And, and we we'll invite you to have a look at foodpanel.com. We, we have a blog with a lot of uh, information about uh, combinations. So I would like to invite Luis to, uh, to round up the presentation. Thank you. No. Just, just to finalize, we are presenting this in gastronomy shows. We are presenting this and using or motivating baristas in, in, in the barista community we run so that they can do their own innovations with coffee, they, in their own coffee beverages. And uh, we are talking to food bloggers. We, this week we are also in Korea. We have done uh, shows in Japan and in Spain. But the, the whole thing is creating more value for coffee and for Colombian coffee in particular. Creating that indulgence and that experience around coffee and making it more rounded and more closer to wine. That's where we started with. So thank you so much for, for your interest and uh, go to the site. Thank you. <laughs>